need of both strength and resilience at this difficult time. We only have to look at what's happening in Canberra. You can see how the political parties, the whole structure is being fragmented. The body politics no longer exists. You've got to remember that politicians, they don't fight for you. They fight each other. And what we need in this country is people that have got practical solutions for the problems that we face and, we can, and they can serve the community. You know, public service should have no reward. Our only reward should be history and to live in a better nation and a better country. It shouldn't be the left or the right or the left right out. It's the country that's left right out at the moment. You, ladies and gentlemen, are the people that are suffering. You are suffering the um, lack of leadership. It's not the old guard, the mud guard, or, or as Bill Shorten would say, the, um, the lost Australians. The whole country is lost. At this critical time, we need to look at what needs to happen. First of all, I'd like to talk to you about a couple of critical issues that face the nation and how we can, how we can solve them. There's the drought. We know that the Liberal and Labor Party spent $50,000 million on the NBN. Can you imagine that? $50,000 million on the NBN. But they spent $200 million on the drought protecting Australian farmers. When I was a member of the House of Representatives, I put forward a bill called the Australia Fund. It's there on Hansard. And the idea was to put government money in the Australian Fund so that when we had a drought, we could use that money to support rural communities, to buy fodder, to import food, because we realise that our agriculture industries are national, are national assets that have to be protected. What we find today is the whole the rural industry of this country is hanging on a cliff, where the Chinese government and others are waiting for our drape out to get worse so they can pounce and buy the heritage of our country that was first established with John MacArthur and others when they reached this nation. And it's a national disgrace that our government is standing by spending $50,000 billion on the NBN we don't need. So it starts from the first proposition, that these people don't work for you, they work for each other. And I've sat in the House of Representatives and I've met them, and there's not one of them that I'd give a job, any of the jobs I've got. And what's worse, they know it. They know it. And that's what they fear, being defeated at the polls and having to work and do something honest for a change. I remember a dinner I had with three Labor senators. We all sat there having a jovial time. They told me that they'd been in the Senate for 15 years, but they hadn't said anything. I said, what do you mean, hadn't said anything? He said, we gave our maiden speech. We haven't said anything for 15 years. I said, well, that's earning your money at $250,000 a year of taxpayers' money. I said, why haven't you said anything? He said, oh, you don't know what it's like, Clive. He said, you know, we've only got one more term to go and then we've got to retire. And we're looking for it to be a director on a super fund or a union official. If we say something, we might upset one of the factions. We mightn't get a job. And then what would we do? We'd have to go on the pension. And we don't want to do that. No one really wants to go on the pension. And when I was in Parliament talking about the pension, they decided they're going to lift the pension age to 70. It was OK for them. I asked the Prime Minister a question. I said, Prime Minister, if we're going to lift the question, uh, pension age to 70, why don't we make it the super entitlement age of parliamentarians as well? They said, don't go there, boy, don't go there, Labor Party said, the Liberal Party said, because they don't care about you. They only care about each other. And when I left the House of Representatives and the press came around and said, why did you ask the Prime Minister that question? They said, because I wanted to bring the pension age down to 39 what the average age is of parliamentarians now that are getting some of their super in the last parliament. And that's a disgrace for this country, you know? So we've got to do something about the drought and about regional Australia. And one of the policies that we have is zonal taxation. If you visit Sydney or Melbourne, you'll see their infrastructure is choked, the roads are congested, there's 50% unemployment in Melbourne, and they've got real serious problems. And if you go in Western communities in New South Wales or in South Australia, you'll see there's plenty of infrastructure where hospitals are half full, roads are empty. If you go to Townsville, where I'm from down the road, you'll see that in Palmer Street, half the shops in the main street are empty. So we want to bring in zonal taxation, not just to help rural communities, but to help the cities as well. To take some of these people out of the city and put them to work in this country. If you visit the United States and you drive from New York to Los Angeles, we've got a decentralised country where it's vital with industry, where wealth is being created. 
And it's a fact that 85% of the wealth of this country is created outside of capital cities. 85% of the wealth. But what's the focus? What's the focus? Is it the Greens in Bondi? Is it Jackie Trad in South Brisbane? You, know, you wouldn't want to vote for the Greens. You know, if you believe that you should have the doll for your entire life and free marijuana, you should vote for the Greens because that's their policy at their last National Council. That everybody will get the doll when they work and the work will be optional. That's the Greens policy and you'll have free marijuana. The government will subsidise not industry or enterprise, but they'll subsidise marijuana distribution. And you remember, some of you here are old enough to remember like me, years ago the government had a, a, a policy, a, a program that they promoted tourism in, in North Queensland, in the United States and Asia. Paul Hogan put another prawn on the barbie. And when that happened, the numbers soared. Our tourism went right through the roof. It was a great success. It was so successful that the, um, the bureaucracy decided they couldn't do it again. Because if they did it again, it might fail and they'd have a failure. Better to live for 30 years on a success and not worry about the people of North Queensland. So our government should be doing more. I've just come back from Italy where I visited the Leaning Tower of Pisa. 50,000 people a day are seeing the Leaning Tower of Pisa. But what is the Leaning Tower of Pisa compared to the Great Barrier Reef? Why aren't, we, why aren't we promoting our country, promoting our people? And we're saying how great it is to be an Australian, what it means to stand for something. And that's why we have to make a stand, ladies and gentlemen, at the next election. That's why we're running candidates in every seat in the House of Representatives. That's why our party, really, when we launched it only four to six weeks ago, now has 5,000 members. That's why we've just completed a campaign in rural New South Wales. We carried out a poll after that. We had 18% first preferences immediately because Australians are fed up. The game's up. When you sit in the House of Reps like I have, you realise it's, it's just a theatre. The Labor and Liberal guys go out for dinner every Friday night together. And the, and the deal is that you scratch my back while you're in government and I'll scratch yours and stuff the people. That's what it's all about, really. And when you're sitting in the House of Representatives, you've got the Speaker, you've got a box on your left and a box on your right which have unelected people in. You don't know who they are. They're faceless people, but they run the country. There's 12 of them from the Labor Party, 12 from the Liberal Party, and they write the speeches for the parliamentarians. They're handed over and they read the word verbatim. And if they don't, they get thrown out of their party. They lose their endorsement. They don't represent you, but that's what happens. But I was a independent member of the House of Representatives. You're not supposed to have them. I was actually an Australian. And I used to ask a question. They allowed me to ask a question once every 14 days. But I wasn't allowed to have a, an apparatchik to sit in the box to tell me what I should do. I could say what I wanted. And every time I said something, they cringed. And every time I did anything for this country, they went out to malign me. The Liberal Party, the Labor Party, the media, the whole lot. Because the whole lot are in it together. And only now are the Australian people realising what I was saying in 2013 was right. Only now are they understanding as their life gets worse, as their country loses its moral fabric, that we have to do something about this as Australians. And Australians have really started to hear it and feel what's been happening in the bureaucracy with high power prices. And no one ever tells you why a power price is so high. So I'm going to explain it to you so you know the true story. You'll remember a time when you only used to get one power bill, and that was the supply of energy about eight or ten years ago. Today you get two bills. You get one for power and one for distribution. Why is that? And the bill for distribution is nearly as high as the bill for the power. That seems a bit crazy, doesn't it? Well, about eight years ago, the Australian Council of State Governments all got together and they, they received a presentation from some US and uh, European contractors uh, in the power and electricity industry, saying that they needed to redo all their distribution in Australia and upgrade it. It was going to cost them $20 billion to do it. All of the politicians, none of them having any experience in business, said, gee, that's a good idea. Would you like to study us and tell me how we, how we do that? And they came back and they said, it's going to cost $20 billion US dollars to upgrade the distribution in Australia. And they said, gee, we haven't got that money. Can you give us the money? And they said, we can. We can. You haven't got to pay anything. 
We're just going to give it to you in a 15% guaranteed return for 30 years. And it was done. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are paying that 15%. While interest rates at the moment are 2 to 3% for the Australian government, we continue to pay 15% for the upgrade of the energy and the distribution of power in this country. And that's the first reason why power is so high. If you, if you weren't doing that, if you're paying that at 2%, it would only be 40% less in your power bill as you're currently receiving. The Greens, the Liberals, uh, the Labor Party all talk about coal-fired power stations. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But even if you had coal-fired power stations, you wouldn't be solving the problem. None of them will address this problem. None of them will have the courage and guts to say that this is an unconscionable conduct, a contract which rips off the Australian people, which deprives our industries of competitiveness, which takes away the jobs for our children and the aspirations we might have in the future. No one will say that because they don't want you to know. They don't want you to know what a real government should do. And a real government should call those contractors in and say, for 10 years you've been ripping off this country and it's got to stop and we'll pass legislation and we'll pay out the debt now and then we'll, we'll be paying 2 or 3% on that money and electricity prices will come down and new industries will be established in this country that can be competitive. That's what's got to happen and that's the tr first part of the power puzzle. The second one, of course, is to do with upsetting coal, uh, the Greens and others about renewable energy. And I've stood on a platform with, with Al Gore, the former Vice President of the United States. I've also promoted renewable energy to a certain extent. There's no reason you can't have some renewable energy, like 5 or 10 per cent, or, some, or some, something of the mix. But you know, this country is the world's biggest exporter of coal. You know, every year our coal exports have increased 10 per cent a year. And that increased coal, the current coal, is burnt in Japan and China. It's primarily burnt, burnt so Japanese and Chinese citizens can have cheap power, while we pay high power. That's what it's used for. But it's also burnt so the Japanese industry and Chinese industry can dominate the world, so that their manufacturing can be exported to Europe and the United States, and while we close down operations in this country, while we lose jobs, and people say, why is it happening? It's happening because you've got politicians who have no competence at all to deal at this level, who haven't any experience in business, who don't know what they're doing. So why is it that Japanese and Australia and uh, Chinese citizens can um, have cheap energy with Australian resources and Australians can't? Are we second class citizens? Is it because many Chinese companies have donated money to the Liberal Party? Is it because they've donated money to the Labor Party? Is it because, for example, Bob Hawke serves on a consultative council um, for the Chinese government, where Bob Carr also does the same thing, um, where Andrew Robb is chairman of the port of, town, of uh, Darwin, and they've sold the port to the Chinese government, despite our American allies being upset about it? But of course, when he got out of Parliament, he didn't go and work for a union. He didn't go and work for a superannuation board. He got a contract for a million dollars to be chairman of the Port of Darwin. It seems like an overpayment to me. But that's what happened. That's what happened, and that's what that, this is all about. And you know, we need to have coal-fired power stations here as well. We need. Our industry needs to have the same benefits that the Chinese and the Japanese have with Australian resources. And if we do, we can be great again and we can make this country work. We must go to our, we must go to our strengths. And more importantly, our citizens and our elderly citizens who can't afford... I had dinner with a, a woman uh, three weeks ago in Canberra, who was 86 years old, living on the pension. I took her out for dinner and she couldn't afford to run her heater at night. She couldn't afford to run her heater at night because of the cost of energy and power. And there are people in Victoria and Tasmania, much colder climates, elderly people, that with their pension can't afford electricity to run the heater, to have heating, to run their electric blanket, that are suffering every single night because of the greed, the greed of the contractors, the greed of the uh, uh, public servants, the whole lot of them really, they're all crooks, you know, they really don't care about you. 
Just go back to it again, ladies and gentlemen, $50,000 million on the NBN and $200 million in all of Australia for our farmers. Just go back to that. That tells you one thing, that they don't care about you one bit. People in this country don't matter to our politicians in Canberra. And, and you know, I'm a, the most heavily criticised person in the country. And why is that? Because all my billboards across the nation say two things, two highly controversial things. They say, make Australia great or put Australia first. I am an Australian. Like the person who welcomed me to country, I have a, I have a close association with the land where I was born. And, and as all Australians do, I want to put this country first. I want to put your interests before the Chinese and the Japanese. And why shouldn't our members of parliament do it? And why shouldn't we be prepared to make it happen? And there's only one person that can change this country, that can make it different, and that's you. You've got the power as citizens as individuals to do something about the country that you love. And why shouldn't you do it? Now, I, I through good fortune or hard work, or whatever you want to call it, I'm the wealthiest person in Queensland. I've got over $3,000 million of assets, but I'm an Australian. So why shouldn't I spend the money required to make sure that we try to claim back this country? And the next election, I'll be spending between 50 to $100 million We'll have double the money of the Liberal and Labor Party, and we'll, regardless of what the media says, we'll get the message out. So Australians can know for a change what the truth is. And I know what the truth is. I've been there and I've seen it happening. There are so many opportunities that have been thrown away. When I was in Canberra and having dinner with the US Ambassador, he said, we're looking, Clive, to have a new a Navy base somewhere in the Pacific. But the Australian government doesn't think we should have it in Australia. We think North Queensland might be a good place. I said, what's it involve? He said, about $10 billion of investment. I said, but there's another problem we're facing, and we're facing that problem all over Asia. The US Congress has decided that our fleet must have renewable energy. They've enacted a parla through Parliament that we must have ethanol or something like that. Where could we get that in Australia? Of course, we could get it from our sugar industry, which is set up here in North Queensland. So the opportunity is there, not just to have $10 billion investment, not just to cement our defence tries with the United States, but also to save our sugar industry. What's wrong with a member for Leichhardt? What's he doing with his hand, head in the sand? Does he care about the sugar industry or you people here? Why have I got to come up here and tell you what's happening? Why isn't he keeping you informed? And even Bob Catter. Why doesn't he really get to the point? And the point is, this could be jobs for Queensland. This could be jobs for Cairns. And that's what we need. Jobs, jobs, and we need future. Why is it when I travel around Australia and I go to rural districts and places like Cairns, families are breaking up. Children are going to Sydney or Melbourne, leaving their ch uh, behind their parents. Why is it? Because the opportunity is gone. That, that we don't realise that this country is everybody. It's everybody in North Queensland, as much as everybody in the Pilbara, the Western Australia, or whether you're down in South Australia. All of us should have the same rights. All of us should have the same opportunity. We're not all born with the same gifts, but we should at least have the opportunity and the rights to do all we can be. So, zonal taxation. The other part of it is our policy is that it's to give people living outside capital cities more than 200 kilometres, a 20% lower tax rate. Because we want to give an incentive to establish industries in the region. Because we want to cloak up the congestion in the cities. And we recognise that that's a great way to do it, to provide the incentive. Now, there was a time in the 1960s in this country where people graduated from university, when they went out to work as doctors in rural hospitals, where they were engineers on major projects, and there was a real incentive to do so because they paid a lower grade of taxation. And that was a time when our budgets were balanced. That was a time of growing our economy. And that was a time of optimism. And what's happened with, what's wrong with optimism? What's wrong with opportunity? And of course, one of the biggest opportunities in Australia, if you're Chinese or Japanese, is buying Australian resources or minerals, exporting them to Japan and China and processing them into a final product. 
So rather than sell our ore for something like $40 to $100 a tonne, we should be selling our final manufactured nickel or cobalt or, or iron or steel at, at up to $20,000 a tonne. We should be taking our resources from Queensland and from Western Australia, not shipping them all to Asia, but shipping them some of them to um, Victoria with this chronic unemployment, to, to, to New South Wales and to other parts of the nation so that we can have a better return as citizens, so that our children can have an increasing prosperity and so that we can rate lot stronger than we do in the world's trading markets. So that's one of the things that we, we believe in. If you go back to uh, 1913, the Commonwealth Government provided guarantees for BHP to establish processing here in Australia, because sometimes you need to borrow five or six billion dollars to do it. And the Chinese government provides similar guarantees to their industry, and so does the Japanese government. So we want, if we want to be competitive, we can do that, if we think the project's good enough, if we think it's what's required, because that massive amount of expenditure is required to compete on a world scale. And the government's got a critical role to play at an important moment to allow all that to happen. Um, you know, since we've started up the party and we've got going, many people have raised a number of questions. They've said, what about, you know, One Nation? What about the Catter Party? And of course, it's totally wrong to have an individual party that depends on any one individual too much. You know, because we've got the Kuri Bernardi Party, we've got the Catter Party, we've got the Hanson Party, we've got the David Lionhom Party, we've had the Glenn Lazarus team, the Nikki Jackie Lambie team, whatever. We want a party that unifies all Australians. With the United Australia Party, I'm happy to stay here and work hard for the next three years or for a term in Parliament to get things going, but I'm 65. I don't have any ambition left. <laughs> I don't have the skills to take the country further forward, but I can't desert our country at a critical time that's been so good to me. And I can't see this nation fall further and further down. All of my relations have a long history in serving Australia. In the First World War, I lost two of my uncles in, 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 um, in Western Europe. In the Second World War, they served the, on the Kokoda Trail and the 39th Battalion in, in Trabuk and uh, in the Middle East. And my nephew, uh, Wing Commander, uh, Martin Brewster, who's sitting here in front of us today, uh, led the team up in, in East Timor. So we've got, my family's got a, a long tradition of, of serving this country. And you know, all of those people have done more than I can ever do to serve this country. And too much is given, much is required. It's my obligation and duty to see if we can establish our party on a competitive level to see if we can break the monopoly and the duopoly that I've witnessed raping our economy and destroying the social fabric of our nation. So I would just say again, the most important person that can make this happen is you. Because you've sat by before and maybe do not done as much as you could have. You've sat maybe at home and criticised who's on television trying to do something. And you've got to realise all of us as individuals have got to try to do something. We may not win, we may not get there, but as Australians we should stick together and fight for our country. And that's what this is about. The people in Canberra, they're hopeless. You wouldn't employ any of them. You know, I've met with them, I've sat in the House of Representatives with them, and none of them cares about anybody. I can tell you that for a start. All they care about is their jobs. You look at recent developments with uh, Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister, leader of the Liberal Party. As soon as he loses his job, he resigns to make it harder for the next Prime Minister. That's loyalty to the party. That's loyalty to the country if you really believe that they're doing the right thing. I don't. It really is. And then he gets over to New York and he rings up and says, look, you've only got a majority of one. Just challenge them in the High Court and get rid of Peter Dutton and the government will fall apart. That's great, isn't it? Here's the leader of the government saying the government will fall apart. It doesn't matter if you like Malcolm Turnbull or you don't like Malcolm Turnbull. I'm not attacking him on his policies. I'm attacking him on his loyalty for what he stands for. And some of you people in this room would have voted for Malcolm Turnbull at the last election. And some of you people would be disappointed 
that we've had five prime ministers in such a long time. I'm disappointed as an Australian. I think we could do better. And we've got to get rid of these professional politicians. You know, they're like a big stew. If you put a big stew on cooking it enough, I don't know if you've ever done that with a billy and some damper, you've been out there, you cook it long and long enough, and you know what rises to the top? You've got to skim it off before you eat it. And that's what these are, guys. They've been in, they've been in politics for 20 or 30 years and they've risen to the top, but they're the scum of the lot that went into politics. I can tell you that. The scum. They're not the top, they're the very bottom of what, of what should be leading this country. I don't really care who's Prime Minister. I don't really care who's the Minister for anything. All I care about is that we get the right policies for this nation and, that we, and, we, and we get the right things happening. You may see when I'm on television from time to time, everybody criticises me and say how terrible I am. It doesn't worry me. All you need to be happy in life, I can tell you, is to have someone that loves you, a good meal every day and a warm bed. That's my philosophy. So beside that, I don't care. I'm not frightened of anything. All I'm frightened of is not doing the best I can for the Australian people. Not doing the best I can to ensure that at least they have a choice at the next election. And you know, things have been very positive for the United Australia Party. We really only started the, uh, uh, the campaign about eight weeks ago. And we looked at a number of areas of Australia which would first test our techniques and see what we were doing as a party before we embarked upon our national campaign in January. And one of those areas was uh, rural New South Wales. Now we polled rural New South Wales and we had a support rating of 2%. That's what we had at the start of the poll. We then invested the funds required to tell the people of, of, of rural New South Wales what was happening. Yeah. What was happening and we did some very um, direct ads, if you like, on television, Facebook, right across social media. Right? And that went on for four weeks. And of course, I did make the comment about the $50,000 billion that's being spent on the NBN and the money that's being spent on their families. You know, that really cut home hard. I had a farmer outside of Tamworth that was walking towards me uh, carrying a, a, a dead lamb who had died a painful death. And the Greens don't care about the cattle that are dying painful deaths in Queensland at the moment. They don't care about that. They care more about not having dams because you might hurt a frog. That's what they care about. And you know, he, he had tears in his eyes and he didn't know what he could do. He had no money left. And I, met, I saw similar people out west of Charleville that had the same problem. And then we get the Premier that provides drought relief for the Queensland Government of $8 million for all of Queensland. And four million of it, four million of it, half of that drought relief is for financial advice. If you haven't got any cattle, if you've lost your property with the bank, what do you need bloody financial advice for? You know, what money have you got? But there's no money to feed the cattle. And in New South Wales, the Liberal government in New South Wales is going one better. They're saying, you've built dams and weirs on your property, and you can have the water that you've built, but we're going to charge you for it. We're going to charge you. Even though you haven't got a, 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 any livestock left, even though you can't afford a meal for your children, we're going to charge you for the water on your own property of the dam that you've built but you're now allowed to have an increased amount you can take during the drought, so you can pay us more money. Is that really what this country has come to? Is that really what Australians are prepared to do for each other? I, you know, while I have a, a couple of rural properties, I'm not a rural person in the context of the industry, but we've got to have compassion, and we've got to be fair dinkum for the other people and other Australians, because it could happen to us, and we would expect them to support us. That's why, with the United Australia Party, because we want to be united as one people together. We don't want to be left or right. We want to have practical solutions to the problems that face this country. The United Australia Party has got a, a very historical significance for this country. It was first established with Prime Minister uh, Sir, um, Joseph Lyons in the 1930s. And I've got, my family's had a, a long involvement with that party. My father established radio station 3AK in Melbourne. Radio 7 UV in Tasmania. And he used to fly with the Prime Minister across Bass Strait. And it came about because the country at that stage, at the end of the Roaring Twenties, was in a state of chaos. That uh, people had taken over you know, financial institutions and the Australian people's rights was being defected. And, uh, and Joe Lyons formed the United Australia Party. And then Bob Menzies 
became a Prime Minister, and of course Billy Hughes was also a Prime Minister and a leader of the United Australia Party. Eventually, um, the Liberal Party took over and the United Party faded away. But that's why we're re-establishing that party, because we think historically we're in a similar situation today. But it's just important as it was then for Australians to unite and be one team together. And it's just as important to put this country first and to put the aspiration of its people first before the aspirations of people in China and Korea. And I, I, I wish them no harm. And I don't mean any racist context by that. I'm just saying that if it's our coal, we should have the benefits of it. If it's our iron ore, we should have the benefits of it. I can't take it from China as a businessman. I can't take it from Japan. I can take it from Australia. And our politicians and our political parties shouldn't take donations from foreign countries, from companies in foreign countries. And many of those companies are owned by the countries that they represent. You may have all seen that I had a major fight with the Chinese government and Citic in my own oil project in Western Australia. Well, you know, the, what the fight was about was that I'd worked 20 years in the desert to discover iron ore, done a deal with them, and they agreed to pay me for it. When I let them on the tenement, they refused to pay me. And they said, we've got more money than you, we'll just crush you. So they tried to crush me for five years and they failed. The West Australian um, Supreme Court order, they pay me $400 million a year for the next 30 years as a starter. And, and they should have too. It wasn't so much about me having $400 million a year or being expenses, about the sovereignty of this country. We can't let foreign government-owned corporations walk into our country and destroy our companies, destroy the fabric of our way of life, buy our politicians, you know, and buy our media and put bad press reports out about our citizens. Now, before I got into politics, and I only got into politics because of a fight I had with Campbell Newman, I was elected by the people of Australia to be a living national treasure. I was the mining entrepreneur of the decade by the Australian Government Awards in 2010. So I wasn't necessarily the person that's portrayed in the media today. But why it's portrayed in the media as it is, is because they want to protect the status quo. The Liberal, the Labor Party want to protect the status quo because they know what I'm saying today is toxic. That if that news gets into the right hands of the Australian people, they'll rise up in index in indignation and throw them out. And that's what we have to do. We have to get that message out. We have to reclaim our country for ourselves. So I'd ask all of you that have come today to think about uh, joining the United Australia Party. As I said, as 5,000 of your fellow citizens have done throughout this country. Um, and we've set up offices, as Jan said, here in, in Townsville, here in Cairns. And there's more offices being established next week in Sydney. Um, I'd like you to work with us in the House of Representatives and the Senate. We're not standing for the balance of power. We're not standing in a couple of seats. We'll be standing in 150 seats in the House of Representatives and every, every seat in the Senate. We don't want the balance of power. We want to throw out all the lots that there and have a government for the people that will protect our interests. That's what we want and that's what we're going to do. And we'll have a bigger, stronger, better campaign than you've ever seen in this country before. And I'm saying to you that because if you know Paul Murray on, on Fox, he stood there in the 2013 election and he said, well, Clive Palmer's going to get 50 votes tomorrow. That's the number of people he's got on his Facebook. But that time, we got three senators, a member of the House of Representatives in six weeks. Because some people thought that some of the things we're saying made sense. And at that time, we achieved a lot for this country. Not many people know of all the things we did. We stopped Qantas from being, far, being sold to mates of the Liberal Party. We stopped a whole range of things that happened. But you don't hear about those things, you know. But the people that were elected with me had, had a lot of pressure from all the other parties to destroy what we were trying to do for this country. But I can guarantee you that I'll leave no stone unturned, that I've got a high resolve to serve my country. I've got a high resolve to bring these things out in the public so that people know what's happening. But just remember again, $50,000 million. What could that do for North Queensland? $50,000 million. That's much bigger than the Queensland economy. Many times bigger than the Queensland economy. 
What would that do for investment, for youth unemployment? What would that do for industry and for our exports? So at this time, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to hope you go on our website and join the fight, because I'm committed as an individual that I'll be working 24 hours a day for you, doing the best I can. And it really rests with you people to help us make things better. Because together, I know we can achieve the extraordinary. Thanks very much.